This is a specialized vehicle that serves a very particular purpose. It is one of the vehicles used to transport the Pope during public appearances all around the world. As such, these vehicles are aptly, though unofficially named, Pope-mobiles. Following a failed assassination attempt of John Paul II in 1981, these Pope-mobiles, with their bulletproof glass windows, became the default choice for public papal transportation. The current Pope, Pope Francis, has described the previous iterations of the Pope-mobile as glass sardine cans, and prefers this more open concept Pope-mobile. Back in 2002, Pope John Paul II famously expressed his dislike of the term Pope-mobile, saying that he thought the term undignified. And he wasn't wrong. It is a rather funny word. It doesn't seem to jibe with the style of other Pope-related terminology, such as papal, papacy, popery, pontiff, supreme pontiff, etc. So what is it about Pope-mobile that doesn't seem to fit? What led Pope John Paul II to perceive it as undignified? Let's try to answer these questions by learning more about compound words. Like derivation, compounding results in the formation of a new lexeme that contains its various inflected forms, like Pope-mobile and the plural Pope-mobiles. Compounds are formed from two stems, which distinguishes them from derivations and inflections. Here's a quick summary. An inflection, a base or a stem plus an affix, leads to a new inflected form. In derivation, a base plus an affix leads to a derived form, which is also a new lexeme. And in compounding, two stems form a compound, which is also a new lexeme. Simply put, Compound morphology is just sticking two words together to make a new one, which is easy enough to do. That is likely why compounding is the oldest and most ubiquitous source of new word formation across all the world's languages. In fact, every natural language, that is, languages that form naturally, contain examples of compounding, some more, some less. For example, roughly 70 to 80 percent of all Chinese words are compounds. The same is true of Japanese. Even constructed fictional languages, such as Klingon from the TV series Star Trek, Elvish from Lord of the Rings, and Dothraki from Game of Thrones, include compound words. In Klingon, the word for fork is puk chonak, puk meaning child and chonak meaning hunting spear. In Dothraki, the word for a blood rider, or someone who has pledged his life in service of his call, is dothrakoi. Dothrak meaning rider, and koi meaning blood. A very tricky aspect of compound words is their written form. In English, compounds can be either open, closed, or hyphenated. Open compounds have a space between the stems. Closed compounds have no space, and hyphenated compounds are hyphenated. These compounds are a nightmare for language learners, and native speakers alike, because whether a compound is open, closed, or hyphenated is not determined by its meaning or the way it's pronounced. This difficulty is only exacerbated by the tremendous fluidity between these forms, meaning that a given compound can be written as either open, closed, or hyphenated, depending on who's writing it. High-frequency words tend to be more stable, but even common words like hot dog can either be written as hot dog or hot dog. When it comes to hyphenation, there are a few loose guidelines to follow. Open compounds that modify another noun are typically hyphenated to avoid confusion. There is a big difference between hot dog soup and hot dog soup. There is also a small subclass of compounds called apositional compounds, such as singer-songwriter, robber baron, actor-director, maid-servant, etc., that always appear hyphenated. Despite this considerable fluidity, there is a general trend in compound form pointed out by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. That is that words tend to enter the language as open compounds and become closed over time. They set examples such as baseball, which was initially open before eventually becoming the closed compound we know and love today. Another important question about open compounds is their striking similarity with noun phrases. 
Is it reasonable to say that maple leaf is a compound, or is it simply a common noun phrase? Contrast this with the ice hockey team, the Toronto Maple Leafs. This is a particularly quirky example, but notice that the team name is Maple Leafs, and not Maple Leaves. That is because Maple Leaf has its own unique meaning. It refers to a member of the team. Its plural form is then the inflected form of the new lexeme, Maple Leaf, and not simply the noun stem, leaf. So keep in mind that compounds tend to have a distinct meaning from their parts though there is often some gray area. Peanut butter is considered a compound, for example, though it is difficult to say how this differs meaningfully from the noun phrase maple leaf. How to draw the line between a compound and a derived form can also get a little murky. For example, you could argue that breathless is a compound formed from two stems, breath and less. Less can be a free morpheme and can act as a stem taking the inflectional affix er to create the comparative form lesser. It can also undergo suppletion to create the superlative form least. However, breathless is classed as a derived form of breath and not a compound. There is similar disagreement as to whether man, in words like fireman or policeman, is a derivational affix or a head constituent. The basic takeaway here is not to worry too much. Drawing thick, well-defined lines between concepts is complicated, and there are some things that even experts can't agree on. As we saw in English, clearly defining open compounds is tricky because the written language divides words using spaces. However, the same is true for closed compounds in languages like Chinese, where words are not divided. There is further complication by the Chinese logographic writing system, where individual characters are used to represent meaning. When the majority of all words are closed compounds, to what extent do you see the characters within a compound as individual words? The colloquial term z, written with this character, can be translated as either word or character, highlighting the blurred lines between these two concepts in the mind of Chinese language users. It's worth taking the time to stop and ask yourself how your experience with your own language shapes the way that you perceive it and others. The morphological processes involved in compound formation are very straightforward compared to inflection and derivation. However, the way that the two stems interact to create new meaning is far more complicated. When stems merge to form a compound, they become morphological constituents. Baseball, for example, contains two morphological constituents, base and ball. We will talk about two central kinds of compounds here, endocentric and exocentric. We'll distinguish between them based on the role that their constituents play in forming the compound's meaning. This is the most archetypal compound form. Endocentric compounds contain a head constituent and a modifier constituent. The head determines both the syntactic category of the compound and its basic meaning, and the modifier provides more specific information. English is a head final language, meaning that the head always appears after the modifier. For example, in the compound word linefish, which was entered into the Oxford English Dictionary in 2019, contains a head constituent fish and a modifier constituent line. The compound refers to a type of fish, specifically one that is caught on a line rather than in a net. One key feature of endocentric compounds is that they are, by definition, hyponyms of the head constituent. Hypo means below as in hypothermia, below a safe temperature, or hypodermic, below the skin. And nim is a Greek word meaning name. So a hyponym is a below word. This doesn't make sense until we define what we mean by up and down. In this case, we're referring to a hierarchy in which more general terms appear higher up and more specific ones appear lower down. So the compounds moonlight, starlight, daylight, and sunlight are all hyponyms of the word light. They each denote a specific kind of light. The opposite of hypo is hyper, meaning above. So the hypernym of these compounds would be the word light. You can see how in endocentric compounds, the relationship between constituents and compounds is easy to interpret. The head determines a broader semantic category, such as light, and then the modifier provides more specific information about it i.e. whether it comes from the sun, moon, or stars. 
Exocentric compounds, on the other hand, do not contain a head constituent, earning them the nickname headless compounds. Neither constituent carries the bulk of the semantic information, nor do either of the constituents determine the syntactic category. Typical examples of exocentric compounds include constituents with different syntactic categories from the compound itself, such as cutthroat or white collar, which are both adjectives, yet the constituents in head position are nouns. In these cases, the compound constituents don't have a hyponymic relationship with the meaning of the compound, but they do sometimes have a metonymic relationship with it. Metonymy is when a particular aspect of something comes to refer to the whole. The classic example is that Washington is often used to refer to the U.S. federal government, which is located in Washington. Similarly, white collar refers to the color of the shirt collars traditionally worn by more upper-class office workers. Other examples are redhead, paperback, yellowtail, or black cap. Another way we can talk about compounds is in terms of transparency. In the compounds bluebird, blackbird, and songbird, each is a hyponym of their head constituent bird, making them all endocentric compounds. They're all types of birds. We could also say each constituent in these compounds is semantically transparent. Black birds are birds that are black, blue birds are birds that are blue, and songbirds are birds that sing. But what about a mockingbird? Is it a bird that mocks? It is still a specific type of bird, so it satisfies the criteria for an endocentric compound. However, the modifier constituent behaves differently than those in blackbird, bluebird, and songbird. That is because it's semantically opaque. The relationship between the word mocking and mockingbird isn't clear. We can therefore categorize these compounds like so. What can we say about the compounds jailbird and lovebird, though? First of all, both are exocentric because neither refer to a specific type of bird. However, the modifiers jail and love do have a clear relationship with the compound meaning. So we could say that jailbird and lovebird have opaque heads and transparent modifiers. Finally, what about the compounds thunderbird and ladybird? Depending on your life experience, thunderbird can either refer to a 1960s TV show, a classic car, or an email app. Ladybird is the British word for ladybug, or a great movie directed by Greta Gerwig. Since none of these have anything to do with birds, the compounds must be exocentric, since neither the modifiers nor heads relate to the compound meaning at all, and both are semantically opaque. All the compounds with bird as the head constituent mentioned above can be referred to as a morphological family. There are roughly 60 members in the morphological family of bird. A compound's family members seem to influence the way that we recognize and perceive them. This is where we return to the question of the Pope-mobile, which we now know is an endocentric compound with a transparent head mobile, or mobile, and a transparent modifier Pope. Considering its morphological family, the likely cause of Pope John Paul II's distaste with the compound is the company that it keeps. The morphological family for mobile includes the following compounds, and many more depending on where you search. Snowmobile, sometimes called ski-mobile, air-mobile, automobile, blood-mobile, book-mobile, bat-mobile, and pimp-mobile. This is certainly not the most esteemed collection of English words, but as they say, you can't choose your family. Another issue arises when we group these words by the semantic relationship between their modifier and their head. We can immediately see a problem here. The semantic relationship that best fits Pope-mobile is for transporting X. However, the other modifiers in this relational category are inanimate objects and also very low frequency. This likens a Pope-mobile to a vehicle for transporting an inanimate object called a Pope. The words in this family that are the highest frequency are from other categories. We know that Pope-mobiles aren't a vehicle for driving on Popes, but given the similarity between Pope-mobile and Snowmobile, it is possible that Pope John Paul II's mind went there subconsciously, and that this influenced his conscious reaction to the word. 
It is also unclear whether the words Batmobile and Pimpmobile were in the Pope's vocabulary, but he was a fluent speaker of 12 languages. If they were, it's understandable that he would have found the comparison less than dignified. At least for me, when I first heard the term Popemobile, I imagined it as a secret crime-fighting vehicle hidden deep below the Vatican in a cave. So I completely understand Pope John Paul's concerns. In this video, we learned about compound morphology. We looked at the written form of compounds, how it can be widely variable, and how our perception of compounds is influenced by the written structure of the language. We also learned about compound meaning. We looked at two compound types, endocentric and exocentric compounds, and discussed the idea of transparency. Lastly, we briefly touched on morphological families and the semantic relationships between compound constituents. Put any questions or requests in the chat, and thank you for listening.